Do you know what time it is? It's supernatural story time. And if you're easily scared, and even if you're not, there's only one thing left to do. Just turn off the lights, because these are stories that you listen to only in the in dark. dark. Never Alone, Volume 2, Story 1. As we have done for many years past, during the spring-summer months, a group of us rented a cabin in the Laurel Mountains of western Pennsylvania for a week. We were having a great time, as tends to happen nowadays with so many of us having demanding schedules. A few of our friends had come and gone from the cabin already. Girlfriends, out-of-staters who had all been present during the first leg of the trip had now returned home, and it was just the five of us. It was Wednesday, and I had actually been called to work the night before, so I myself was on my way back to the cabin, and I was tired, exhausted. In fact, I made my way down Route 30 East, barely keeping my eyes open. I eventually reached the welcoming scene of Laurel and was glad to be there. The weather was flawless, a perfectly sunny day, given the appearance of a hot afternoon, but the morning chill was enough of a reminder that it was still 7 a.m. I approached the main road of the campsite and noticed a full-size U-Haul parked in the center of the road. Abandoned? I thought it was odd, but I was tired and didn't care too much. As I pulled up to the gravel turn leading to our cabin, I started smelling something. I couldn't quite place it in my exhaustion, but it was a familiar smell, an acquired smell, if you will. As I reached the top of the ridge, I hit the brakes. There, previously hidden by the hill, was a truck, and latched up to the truck was a horse trailer with two horses inside. Now, this state park doesn't even allow dogs on site, so to say I was amazed would be an understatement. The truck was completely blocking my passage to the cabin. As I sat there, I had some time to look around. What I saw next was one of the most ridiculous sights I can conjure. In front of the cabin, that neighbors, ours, were six sheep. They were grazing in the front yard. Along with the sheep was a single chicken. Parked behind the cabin was another truck with another horse trailer. And in that trailer were two cows. There were about five toddlers running amok and a dog along with them. I stared at the woman in front of my car as if she were something out of a horror film. Apparently the only adult present. She moved the truck that was in my way and I drifted on towards our cabin, which is only about 25 yards away from where all of this was going on. As I made my way behind the now farm cabin, I saw another woman and a teenage boy sitting in the grass. The woman looked like she was no more than maybe 17 or 18 years old, and she was pregnant. Not only pregnant, but her belly looked like it was ready to burst at any second. She was in a period dress and a bonnet. The boy was maybe 15 or 16, and he was in suspenders. I thought that was one hell of a thing to see at a state park, but hey, whatever. I have no problem with animals. If these folks somehow managed to persuade DCNR, to allow them a cabin with all of Noah's Ark in tow, so be it. They weren't bothering us, apart from the smell. I rolled up to our cabin and retrieved the key from the hiding spot my friends had left it in for me. I unlocked the door and slipped inside. I was surprised to see my friend, the bassist, awake. We usually didn't wake up for another couple of hours. I greeted him and saw the biggest smile on his face. I immediately knew something had happened that night. He told me the following as closely as I can remember it. I was asleep in my bunk when I heard pounding on the door and saw flashlights coming through the front window. I thought it was you coming home from work. So I got out of bed and said, what the F? Turn on the porch light and open the door. When I opened the door, the sheriff was standing there. I was in nothing but boxers, so the first thing I said was, hold on, let me put some clothes on. So I got dressed and went back to the door and he asked who was in the cabin. I explained to him who was present and stated that you were at work. He then asked who owned the green Jeep Grand Cherokee parked outside, and I told him I did. He then held up a picture of a stocky man in his 40s and asked if we had seen him. I told him no, and he said that the man was wanted for violent crimes all throughout Pennsylvania, and he was last seen driving a green Jeep Grand Cherokee. The sheriff then got on his radio and said, stand down. Apparently, my friends then heard noise all around the exterior windows of the cabin, 
and about five officers came around to the door. They were ready to move on the cabin. My friend asked them if they need anything else, and all the sheriff said was, see ya. So, I got home and my buddy told me all of this, and the first thing I'm thinking is that it sounded odd. The field I worked in isn't necessarily law enforcement, but it's in the same ballpark. I worked in everything from loss prevention to private security firms. At the very least, I have some experience making arrests and being part of investigations. I thought it was extremely weird that officers never gave us a number to call if we saw the guy or anything and just said, see ya, upon finishing his questioning. The first thing I thought of was that the sheriff was an imposter and was casing the cabin. But that didn't make too much sense. Time would be better spent casing residential homes if you want to steal anything of value. In the end, I decided that the officers were real. They were just doing shitty police work. A couple of hours went by and my friend and I went down to the ranger station. The head ranger took us into his office and pretty much confirmed everything. He told us that the same sheriff had stopped and visited him, but refused to give him any information on the wanted man. Did not even show the ranger his picture, but then asked if the ranger would keep an eye out for him. It was all quite baffling and we ended up giving the ranger the description from the picture. After we discussed the wanted man, we were asked if we had seen the circus up at cabin number 10, our neighbors. We all had a good laugh and he asked how many people were there. We told him about all the kids and the pregnant woman and what we assumed was the mother figure. He then asked if we'd seen the horses. I said, yeah, they have a car at a farm up there. He looked at me and asked what else they had. According to him, the woman begged him to allow him to stay for just the night, but she told him they only had horses and a dog. She paid for the entire week and just planned to stay that night. I guess they were moving from somewhere down south to New Hampshire and couldn't find a place to stay. I felt bad for them. That must be rough traveling with all those animals and children. When the ranger heard about the cows and the sheep, he gasped and then said in disbelief. He just shook his head. It was quite funny. So then, following that discussion, he asked us if we had noticed any suspicious men around cabin four. We told him we had not, and he said he believed that there had been a man squatting there for some time when there are no vacation or staying. This part was the creepiest, because last year when we stayed at the park, we discovered there was someone staying in the cabin next to us, the farm cabin, but we never saw him, and he had no car. Perhaps I'll just go ahead and tell that story too. After visiting with the ranger, we returned to the cabin and had a great rest of the trip. But regardless, all of this was strange and borderline creepy. Now, this is the story of what happened to us from the previous trip. We had rented the same cabin for the week. The trip was going great. There was about nine of us there all together. And by the second day, everyone was having the time of their lives. We all decided to go for a hike. But my sister and another girl visited decided to stay at the cabin. So we left and my sister sat on the porch while the other girl went and took a nap. According to my sister, about 20 minutes after we left, a man strolled up to the porch and started asking my sister questions. He asked, how old are you guys? And how many of you are staying here? Any guys inside the cabin? My sister pretended not to hear him and immediately got up and went inside and locked the door. When we returned, she told me about this and I asked where the man went after she came inside. She said she watched him but out the window and he went behind the neighboring cabin which was the farm cabin from the other story, and that he disappeared. I didn't think too much of it. I thought the man probably had ill intentions, but my sister did the right thing, and we decided no one was going to go anywhere alone after this happened. So the next day went by and it was forgotten about. We all took a drive to the top of the mountain that night and stayed out pretty late. When we returned, I thought I saw lights on inside of the vacant cabin, but they looked blue. I told myself it was just the light from some appliance, but I had that funny feeling about it. After everyone else went into our cabin, I drove out to a spot a few miles down the road where we could get a cell signal. I called my mom and asked her to check and see if the cabin next to us was still available for the week. She informed me it had been rented out for 10 days. So now I was a little sketched. I got back to the cabin and got the mechanical engineer in the group and the bassist to take a ride with me. We just drove the main road for a couple of times so I could explain all of this to them. They both agreed that they had thought they saw blue lights in that cabin at one point or another, but had just played it off as some appliance. We decided that I would forgo my spot in our bedroom and sleep by the door the rest of the week. We were armed during this trip, but I got a big club-like stick from outside and brought it in 
and leaned it against the door. I put my bedroll right in front of the door and slept there. At around 2 a.m., I heard a huge thud on the porch. My buddy from Philly, who's the bum from previous stories, was sleeping in the main room, and I called out to him, Outside, now! We jumped up, flicked the porch light on, and ran out, but found nothing. Someone was knocked over from our wood pile, but other than that, there was no signs of life. And that very well could have been anything. So we went back to sleep without further issue that night. We woke up the next morning, and the blinds were closed in cabin 10. The way the cabin is set up, and I've stayed there, there's a central room where even if someone was looking in all the windows, you could hide. There's also a loft where no one would be able to see you. So it's very plausible someone could be in there without anyone knowing. We went about our daily hikes and had a great day. We did notice that day that at the parking spot, maybe a third of a mile down the road, an SUV had been parked there without moving all week. We thought perhaps it was the squatter's car, but we were never sure. We got back to the cabin that night, and our porch light was out, and the light that runs to the outhouse was also out. At this point, we were pretty much convinced someone was screwing with us. The engineer fixed the light on our porch, but the one down at the outhouse was completely broken. The outhouse is directly behind cabin 10, by the way. So we made a new policy stating that no one could go to the outhouse unless escorted by myself from that point on. The engineer and myself decided that we needed to do something. So we took a rock and went down to cabin 10 and placed it outside the screen door. That way if anyone came out, the pebble would fall and they wouldn't be able to put it back the way it was while still re-entering the cabin. The rock was on the ground the next morning and some of the drapes were reopened. Someone had come out of the cabin that night. We stuck to our rules the last couple of nights and everything was fine. We could still see the blue light emitting from different cabin windows during different times of the night and I eventually decided the light must have been from a laptop or monitor of some sort. We had no other issues or encounters with whoever was in there. This was a case where I was extremely worried for the girls in our group and even some of the younger guys. It was creepy just thinking that the guy who approached my sister may have been there the entire time watching us. But we kept our heads on straight and with such a big group I can't imagine he would have tried anything so all was well. Thinking back I often wonder if it would have been good to notify someone but we were a pretty capable group and outside of the rangers searching the cabin, which they wouldn't do if somebody had legally rented it out anyway, there wasn't going to be any more help than us just enforcing safety, the rules for ourselves. Story number two. Here's some background information about me. I was born and raised in the South. Hunting, fishing, and being outside is what I'm all about. I've been lost alone in woods and have been in places that if one would allow it to happen, to scare anyone. Now this story takes place back in 1986 in the woods around Tignall, Georgia. I was at a hunting camp with some friends. I'd spot a nice area that had been clear cut three or four years ago. The undergrowth was about head high and thick as could be. Perfect place for deer to hide. My companions told me that they had hunted the area before but to no avail. I thought it was perfect. I drove my truck up the service road to the end of the clear cut where the big trees overlooked. I carried a portable deer stand to a nice strong tree and climbed up. On the way to the stand, I passed an old foundation and still standing chimney of a very old house, pre-Civil War, I guessed. I sat up there in the tree for hours, no sign of anything. I looked at the old chimney, and there was a man in a dark jacket looking at me. Although I had permission to hunt the land, I decided to make contact and make sure I wasn't on someone else's property. I waved. He did nothing. I climbed down and walked over. No one there. I went back up the tree and he was back. On my third trip back up, I yelled at the man. He didn't move. I broke a fundamental law of hunting. I zeroed in on the man with my scope. He was wearing a plain jacket and pants. I could see his beard. Now really ticked off, I went back down, walked over to the chimney, and looked at some landmarks I had found with the scope. An old bucket near the chimney, a tree with two busted limbs, these landmarks were directly behind the man. Once again, I climbed down, walked over to the chimney, examined the ground. No footprints except mine. Now, I was scared and mad. I thought some of my buddies were screwing with me. I checked all around the old foundation and surrounding area. Nothing. I decided to get the heck out of there. 
and went back up the tree to get my tree stand and took another look. Sure enough, there he was. I then did something I had never done. I put a round from a thirty oh six rifle right above his head. He didn't even blink. I knew then something was very wrong. I repeated the shot, but this time right at his feet. Same result. By that time, I was ready to go. On my way past that old house, I saw where my bullet had hit the ground and where the other had hit the chimney. All I wanted to do was to go. I did, in a hurry. I got to my truck and got the heck out of there. As I was driving up the service road, I was shaking. I stopped and thought about the whole morning. Why were there no birds? How come I didn't see any signs of deer, rabbits, squirrels, or other woodland creatures? When I got to the main road, I saw an old black man working in his garden. I stopped and asked him about the land I was just on. He laughed at me for hunting that land. Ain't nothing that lives down that road but trees. He added that during the Civil War, a whole family was killed by a stranger who was never caught. Or at least, that is what his grandpa told him. All he knew was that it was a waste of time to hunt anything down in those woods. I went back to the deer camp and lodge, quietly packed my stuff and left without saying a word. I never told the story for the ridicule the guys would have given me. But every now and then I have a dream where I'm up in that tree and the man walks up to the tree. I wake up scared as a baby. Wouldn't you? Story number three. When I was around 12, I went camping with my parents near Crooked Lake in Michigan. My best friend joined us the next day. We went hiking after breakfast. It was a beautiful early summer day. As we went down dirt roads, we noticed a farmhouse in the distance and walked down to it. It was next to an old pond that had been going kind of swampy and was built into the side of a hill. All the windows were gone, and at a little distance we were trying to see inside. It was black, way too dark, like the windows had been blacked out or something. We were good at throwing stones, so we put a few through the empty windows. As we got closer, that's when it hit us. We just knew we were being watched. But it wasn't only that. It was dead silence accompanied by a sense of dread and doom. This is the only time in my life I've experienced this terrifying mix of emotions. Being stupid young kids, my buddy and I started to dare each other to go in. Neither of us wanted to give in and chicken out. So we both mustered our collective courage, slowly went in, me first. The fear was almost electric and it was very dark and gray inside. We had no flashlight, so we had to be careful because some of the floorboards were warped and missing. That's when we were paralyzed with fear in the main hallway. We knew there was something behind us, blocking our exit. Like an evil presence, we could feel the dark pressure on our backs. We both turned around, and against the grayish darkness, a pitch black figure stood. We saw it for a full second, I guess, which was like an eternity. It moved very fast and looked like it was flat and it was absolutely black like a hole in the fabric of the universe I'll never forget how it was kind of short looked like it was wearing a cape and quickly glided away there was no way we were going to go back that way we had an urge to bolt and we could see some light coming from the basement stairs so we ran as fast as we could to our tremendous relief we came out into a well-lit set of about four stalls a relief turned to horror as our eyes adjusted to the light. The walls were smeared with blood. Lots of it. Upside down pentagrams painted in blood too, and what looked to be two dead cats that had been ripped apart, heads and body parts scattered on the floor. We ran as fast as we could through the wide open door and didn't stop until we got back to our camp. Our parents had gone fishing, so we sat in the camper and just looked at each other, shocked and in total disbelief at what had just happened. As we talked about it, we were in total agreement that this was not our imagination. It was just too vivid. When my dad got back, I told him everything. He chalked it up to youthful fantasy. I offered to prove it to him and showed him. It was evening, so we drove over to the abandoned farmhouse. I wouldn't go into the house, so we went around the back into the stall entrance. The ripped up cats were gone but the blood on the walls was still there. I could see this was making an impression on him. He said he was going up the stairs into the house. I begged him not to go. But when my dad made up his mind, there was no stopping him. I told him I wasn't going. He said okay and walked up the stairs. He was gone what seemed like forever. 
I could hear the floorboards creaking over my head as he walked around. And then he stopped walking. A few minutes later, he came back down the stairs. I asked him if he saw anything, and he said, Nope, but it is kind of creepy up there. To this day, I carry a flashlight in my car and in my school backpack everywhere I go. A truly terrifying experience. I will never forget. Next story. This happened about 2001. Some friends and me, we were out at our farm having a good old time. I think it was Memorial Day. We cooked down the grill, played a bunch of football, and basically goofed off as teenagers so often do. It wasn't until that night that things got interesting. But first, some backstory. My mother-in-law passed away when my wife was 18. She suffered from schizophrenia most of her adult life, and it culminated with her refusing a blood transfusion. Jehovah's Witness told her it was a sin and dying in our living room. Whenever my mother-in-law was episode free, my wife would sense a dark presence watching her in the house. When she prayed, it would feel like the thing was challenging and mocking her. When her mother was having an episode, the house would feel peaceful. But her mother would be tormented. It is my belief that a demonic entity was somehow territorially tied to our home. Back to the story. That night, the gang of people here split off into two groups. One was inside watching some dorky movie, the other out near the fire. I was in with my wife. Two of the girls came in and said, Something's wrong with Dave. Name changed to protect the innocent. Two of the guys ran out and brought him back in the house. He was carried in, almost comatose, breathing very irregular. We spent a few precious seconds trying to wake him, and he decided to get emergency services involved. While we waited, he tossed and moaned, stared off in a trance-like state, and breathed out sickeningly cold air. We followed the ambulance to the ER and waited anxiously for word. The EMTs told us that they had lost his pulse three or four times during the ride. Within a half hour of anxious waiting, the nurse came out and told us the news. He was awake and nothing was wrong with him. His blood work all came back clean and normal, no drugs, nothing amiss. The next day, the pieces fell together in a strange way. The two guys that snagged him from outside reported feeling an eerie presence near the tent he was in, and after praying, said they heard footsteps running in every direction away from the tent. Nobody else was outside. Dave's account was even more interesting. He told us how he'd begun to get a sickening headache and felt incredibly dizzy. As he finally fell down in the mouth of the tent, he looked up from the ground and saw a man with a twisted face wearing a white tuxedo standing in the door of the barn, smiling at him. Next story. When I was about 10 years old, my parents took me on one of their road trips. I don't remember where we went, but my mom loved for the family to get in the Pontiac station wagon and go for a country drive. Anyway, we were way out in the country, and my parents were talking to some other adults, so I took our little dog for a walk. There was an old church a few hundred yards away, so that's where we headed. After poking around for a while, I saw a small cemetery in the woods about a hundred yards further back from the church. I was walking my dog through the cemetery, reading the names on the headstones and marveling at the dates. The dates all corresponded to the pioneer period, mid-1850s. I came to the notice. There were several graves of women's and beside them a small grave. Based on the dates of the headstones, it was obvious the little graves were newborn infants and they and the mother passed away during delivery. I was thinking how dangerous life back then was especially for women, when suddenly a strong wind blew through the pines behind me. These are rather tall, mature trees. The wind was sudden and strong enough to cause me to turn, yet the wind did not hit me. A few seconds later, a gust of cold air blew through. It was there and it was gone, not a sustained wind or breeze. I had a feeling of fear come over me. What freaked me out was my dog's reaction. The hair on her back stood up and she started growling, and pulling against the leash to get out of the cemetery. She was a poodle Pomeranian mix, very calm. I had never seen her like this. I took her advice, and we ran away back to my parents. That's it. I still remember that incident, though. It wasn't a windy day, so much so that this wind was almost an entity in and of itself. The ambient temperature was about mid-80s. This wind was chilly enough to raise goosebumps. Significantly, I had not been spooked or felt anything eerie the whole time we were in the graveyard, up until this point. Hmm. 
I could chalk it up to childish imagination had it not been for my dog's reaction. Next story. This took place in August 2000 in St. Francis, South Dakota. We, as a family, sundanced every August. This time around, my younger brother Donald and his family, two girls and one stepdaughter, came to support us with Donald intending to pray and sacrifice. It was hot and muggy, so Donald asked if he and his family could sleep on the porch of my house as I was already camped at the Sundance site. I told him the AC worked, so his girls were going to bunk out in the living room while he and his companion were still going to sleep on the porch. In the early hours of that following morning, our dog was barking nonstop. As this was annoying, Donald sat up, ready to tell the dog to shut up, but something on the road caught his eye. My house is 30 or so yards from the road. A woman in a white dress was walking south, but she was about a foot over the blacktop. He could see the feet of this woman moving, but they were not touching the road. In a panic, he nudged his companion awake and told her to look. As they both looked in disbelief, the woman continued on her way. By this time, another amazing thing happened. A white car came from the north, also but a foot off the road, stopped to give the woman hitchhiker a lift. The woman floated into the open door of the car, and the instant she got in, the car and the woman vanished into thin air. As unbelievable as it sounds, my brother and his companion saw this. They then went inside the house, locked the house, turned on the light, smudged, and stayed up the remainder of the night. The place where the car vanished is where five people died in a head-on crash in 1968. About three years later, two brothers also were killed there. Still later, a woman flipped her car traveling north and lost her life. Another person lost his life there in 2002. So from time to time, these things happen. Next story. In college, a buddy of mine was really into photography, especially natural landscapes and scenery. In the fall of 2010, he received a new camera for his birthday. I say new because it was actually an old camera that still used film instead of a memory card. However, as he later told me, it was particularly well suited to the kind of outdoor photography he wanted to do. Anyway, he decides he's going to go camping that weekend and try out his new toy. Now, I grew up in Virginia and have done a great deal of camping. I gave him a few recommendations about this and that. The one recommendation that sticks out now was, oh, you should bring a knife if you have one. He packed his stuff and steps off. Took the Metro North train to the Appalachian Trail stop. Yes, you can actually get from downtown New York City to the Appalachian Trail without using a private automobile at all. He walked around all day, snapped photos, and enjoyed a mid-falls hike. Because he wanted only to test out the new camera, he only brought a single roll of film and just left it in the camera the whole time, even after he pitched his tent, made his fire, and went to bed. He spent a grand total of one night up there. The next part is crucial. When I asked him later where he made camp, he said it was not in a designated campground, but sort of a bluff overlooking a small valley. He said he hadn't seen anyone around at all and hadn't seen indications of people there either, as in footprints, drag marks, used pit fires, etc. So remember that my buddy was not in a normal camping spot. He came back down to the city of Sin Sunday afternoon. I asked him how it went, and he said it was great, and he was going to take the film roll to the photo lab on campus the next day to see how everything came out. Sure enough, the next day, I got a text message on my phone from him. It was very spooky. I was expecting something like, hey dude, got the photos, come check them out if you want. What I got was, come back to the suite now. Now, this guy was my best friend in college. We lived in the same suite senior year, and were captains on the fencing team together. The feeling I felt just reading that text in the middle of the day on a big urban campus was the same I've had while being alone in the dark woods. It's that mysterious being watched feeling. Well, I beat feet back to the suite, and got to my buddy's room. He started flipping through the developed photos. It was all beautiful fall scenery. He said, I was just going through them and found this, the last photo. The very last photo of the entire roll was a picture of my buddy asleep in his tent. We talked about it for a while and I asked him if he was certain that he had not seen anyone walking around. I asked if he'd accidentally crossed onto private property perhaps, all that kind of stuff. We came to the conclusion that it was probably either A, 
a local who was having a little too much fun with a city kid, or B, somebody with maybe a little more devious intent who for some reason decided not to. When we inspected his kit, everything else was there. No messages or anything like that. Just a photo, straight up terrifying for him and unsettling for me. Since then, he only camps with others and with a night 8-inch K-bar I helped him pick out. I just went on my first camping trip of the summer with my little lady and my big old Mossberg. Next story. Me and one of my good friends were four-wheeling out around Highway 55 in Apex, North Carolina a couple of years back. Some interesting things happened that day. We started off following some power lines and soon veered off on a side trail. A bit down the trail, we saw some old hut-looking thing and a few small houses. They were overgrown and had no glass in the windows, so they were obviously very old. I got that feeling of we shouldn't be here and told my friend to turn around and leave the place. But of course he wanted to investigate and told me to man up. So we got off our ATVs and went into the first hut. The feeling intensified as we got closer, and finally, I couldn't take it and was like, Dude, we gotta go now. As we were driving off, I heard some man yell, You boys better not come back here again or I'm gonna cut your tongues out. We were both pretty freaked and hightailed it out of there. A little bit later, we came across a gravel road, which we had never seen before. We turned down on the road, and little did we know it would lead us into the strange little neighborhood type place, except it was in the middle of pretty much the woods, with the road being the access point. We were both kind of freaked out because the house, if you can even call them that, were very old but seemed to be lived in. There were gardens and lawn furniture and even kids' toys in the yards, except they were all overgrown with grass and weeds and rusted over, which was in complete contrast to everything else. We were very creeped out at this point but kept on going and ended up at a pond maybe a quarter mile down. This is where things got really weird. There was a huge house sitting on this pond. I mean massive, like a mansion status, sitting right in the edge of this pond. Around the pond was this really nice and peaceful meadow with grass and soft moss and the sun filtering through the trees. The house itself looked like something condemned from a horror movie. It was falling apart, the windows all broken and boarded up, the wood peeling off, shingles coming off just completely coming apart. There was one window that was unboarded, and it was at the very top where the attic would have been. The strange part was there was a light on in this top room. Though it was flickering, it seemed to be a candle. Second we got eyes on this house, we'd frozen. Both had this overwhelming sense of paralyzing horror. We could barely breathe, let alone talk. We stood there watching the house for what had to be ten minutes before we saw a shadow move up in the top window. I don't know if it was a person living there or something else, but... We got the hell out of there as fast as we could. Something just felt completely wrong about the place. The weird part was it was fairly close to Highway 55, right outside of Apex. We never rode there again. I honestly don't think I've ever felt fear like that before. And this is after having encountered the sharks, being chased by bears, and having a gun held to my head. Nothing happened to us, but we never talked about that again. Next story. Back in the late 70s, I was a single mom and lived in an apartment complex that contained several set of quads. Back then, you could still pay the rent using cash money. The manager was very new. I think it was her first month on the job. I drove up to the office to pay my rent. and As I parked my car, I saw a guy run out of the office and down the street towards the main road. As I approached the office, the manager came running out yelling for one of the other employees. Seems I'd interrupted a robbery. He'd had a knife to her throat and was threatening her when I drove up. Fast forward a few weeks, and I was in my apartment, which was right above the manager's apartment. It was late at night, and I'd fallen asleep watching TV in the living room. I suddenly woke up with all the hairs on my body at attention. I looked at the door and noticed that the chain wasn't in place. The only locks I had on my door was the cheap door lock and the chain. No deadbolt. I saw my door not being turned, so I got up and set the chain and stayed in front of the door listening. I was so scared I couldn't think straight. Soon I heard the stairs creak and I knew whoever it was was leaving, so I went to the window to look out. I could see someone leave the building and they stayed close to it in the shadows as they were leaving. I don't know why it never entered my head to call the cops. Talk about stupid. But I was so scared and by the time it was over, there wasn't much they could do anyway. The next day I went to the office to pay for a deadbolt to be installed and the manager told me that 
She had heard that the thief was trying to figure out which apartment was hers so that she couldn't testify against him since she was the only one who could recognize him. I didn't stay long at that complex. When my first six months were up, I was out of there.